Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, so I think uh, we are again discussing upon the issue of present movement in India, uh, which is basically uh, section third of uh, the discussion that we are having uh, in terms of continuity and change. Friends, on present movement in India, we had tried to spoke about uh, various movement that we had. And I think uh, if you try to see the various movements, uh, just to name a few, we have spoken about uh, the Tebhaga, uh, Telangana <coughs> movement and we have the Mofla rebellion. So, I think uh, we try to categorize uh, them historically, we try to see what were the prevailing uh, situations which were prevalent with regard to the uh, various movements, we try to see what is the agrarian social structure which was prevalent. And also, we try to see that to what extent uh, the changes which have been brought about has been carried forward. Uh, but to be interesting, uh, we can say that uh, those movements have been in and around the uh, so called uh, uh, independence or pre independence uh, era. And basically, we try to see that uh, these movements have something to do with the uh, uh, the national politics with regard to the India's in independence. And that way I think uh, these movements uh, can be seen bit historical. But uh, the movement that we are going to discuss right now, uh, it is a very uh, uh, sensitive movement uh, which basically has its roots in the history. But uh, if you try to see, uh, we can say that uh, it has its contemporary relevance also. So, basically in uh, the unit 12th, uh, we are going to speak about the Naxalbari movement. I think uh, when we say Naxalbari movement, many things comes in you, into your mind. Basically, we try to speak about uh, the Naxalite movement, uh, which is popularly uh, figured in various states of <coughs> Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand and also in some parts of Bihar. And I think uh, when we try to speak about the Naxalite movement, uh, many things are there which comes uh, into picture, uh, basically something which is more radical and trying to fight against the nation. And also we try to see the Naxalbari movement, Naxalite movement, uh, which are seen more as the hardcore movement having certain amount of, uh, uh, what you can say, violence. And that way I think uh, the Naxalbari movement uh, is going to be a bit critical. I think uh, when we try to speak about uh, the other movements, they also had certain amount of violence, but that violence was restricted to a specific region and uh, to a specific domain. And I think uh, the enemies would have been uh, sort of uh, region specific or uh, space specific. But uh, Naxalbari movement I think has a long history in terms of its uh, reach. We can say that uh, this uh, Naxalbari movement uh, which has its prominence in uh, the area of uh, uh, West Bengal, Bihar and other parts. But somehow we also say that uh, this movement has some bearings from the past movements that we have discussed. So, the Naxalbari uh, which became a famous for being the site of the left wing poor peasant uprising in the year 1967 and which began with the land to the tillers slogan. And that way, the Naxalbari uprising was triggered on 25th May 1967 in the Naxalbari when the police opened a fire on a group of villagers who were demanding the rights to cross at a particular period of time. And the leader were uh, the uprise of uh, the uprising were Charu Mazumdar and was inspired by the CPI ideology. Thus, we may find that uh, in this particular discussion, we are going to speak about the genesis, social condition and the outcome of the movement. To be more specific, uh, <coughs> we will be speaking uh, in this discussion about the region uh, in which it has been located, 
we will also be speaking about uh, the community and also the social structure of that particular area <coughs> and more importantly uh, the topic of our concern that is the Nexel Bali present struggle. So, uh, friends uh, the main objective of this unit is to acquaint you with the social background of the Naxal Bari area, the role of CPI that is Communist Party of India in raising the issue, the causes of the Naxal Bari movement and the important leadership in the movement. So, uh, I think uh, just to provide a background about this movement, uh, there is a sufficient evidence to believe that the pro-Chinese component of the top CPI Marxist leadership in West Bengal has actually encouraged the communist cadre in Siliguri subdivision to develop the militancy on the peasant front. One of the leading activists of the Naxalbari movement claimed that in a Krishak Sabha meeting in 1964, a Konar had argued forcefully that the parliamentary path was mere trickery and that they should prepare for an armed struggle without which the fundamental change in the agrarian front cannot be achieved. So, the Naxalbari peasant uprising accelerated the existing schism within the CPIM and the extremist radical change were either expelled or they dissociated themselves from the party. The Darjeeling district committee had to be dissolved and as many as 40 members were expelled from the party. So, the communist party of China that is CPC which has been providing the moral support to the radical dissenters within the party hailed the Naxalbari event as a spring thunder over India, which according to them was a prelude to the revolutionary transformation ahead. The most conspicuous among the breakaway group was the Naxalbari O Krishak Sangram Sahayak Samiti that is NKSSS Naxalbari and Peasant Struggle Assistance Committee led by Sushital Roy Chaudhary. He was earlier editor of the CPIM organ uh, that is Deshit Ashi from which post he wrote uh, he was removed forcefully. Thereafter, he started another paper that is Desh Bharati which served as the mouthpiece of the NKSSS. Among other important splinter group were the commune group which advocated a guerrilla type of revolution pattern on the Cuban model of the Guria. This group operated clandestinely from within the CPIM. It was at the initiative of the NKESS which has gained the recognition of the expelled members of the CPIM of the Darjeeling District Committee under the chairmanship of Charu Mazumdar, Kanu Sanyal and Soran Bose that the formation of the Coordination Committee of Revolutionaries that is CCR was spearheaded and came into existence by August 1967. This was before the Madurai meeting of the CPIM, the Central Committee on 18th August 1967. The establishment of the CCR had led to the similar formation in the state of Bihar, Punjab, Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh, Jammu Kashmir and Kerala. The extremist in Andhra Pradesh deferred the uh, understanding uh, to the formation of coordination committee until they were expelled by the CPIM in their Burdwan plenum in the April 1968. By November 1967 again at the initiative of the West Bengal coordination committee of communist revolutionaries that is WBCCCR the different state coordination committees resolved to form the All India Coordination Committee of Communist Revolutionaries that is AICCCR. Thus, the extremists within the various states were organized with amazing rapidity and this was followed by their coordination at the interstate level. So, by 22nd April 1969, the process has reached its logical culmination with the formation of the third Communist Party of India on the birth century of uh, V. I. Lenin, the chief architect of the Russian Revolution. The formation of the new party was announced by Kanu Sanyal at the May Day rally in Calcutta. So, 
the birth of the Communist Party of India Marxist Leninist that is CPI ML can be distinguished from the CPI M on several counts. The latter came into existence as a consequences of the division within the CPI. It was a mobilization of protest within the party which gradually has led to the severance to ties from the undivided party. A new party was born out of the womb of the agrarian struggle and its period of gestation and maturity was irrevocably linked with this struggle. It took a definite form by stages. It also emerged as a result of the combined effort of many groups and festivals fired by a common vision of revolution. It was a different in yet another sense that the new party attracted many recruits who were novice without any prior political socializations and whose first political experience was becoming the member of the third communist party of India which promised a revolutionary transformation of society. However, the CPIM it should be remembered was the only one through the major constituent of Naxalite politics. There were others like the MCC who championed the cause of armed seizure of political power by the countries most oppressed. Once the ideological and the political base of the Naxalite groups in different states were crystallized as the CPI ML, they entered the political arena with the renewed vigor. This time the programmatic content differed uh, substantially from that of the present uprising in Naxalbari in 1967. From the massive participation of present for forceful occupation of Benami, Westland and Khasland, emphasis was now placed on the liquidation of the class enemies by program of annihilation through, through the use of the guerrilla tactics which is uh, popularly called as the annihilation of the class enemies. The mass movements were rejected as the revisionist and the secret and underground small group squads replaced them with the aim of seizing the political power. The program of strengthening base areas and preparing a people's liberation army were not given any serious thought. In short, the Maoist strategy underwent a transformation in which Lin Pio's strategy during the Chinese guerrilla offensive against Japan were invoked to legitimize the new strategies. The brutal suppression of the movement by the ruling Congress party led to the unusual phenomenon of mass emigration from the communist to the non-communist party that is the Congress. This emigration took place partly on account of the newly acquired charisma of Indra Gandhi riding on the crest of military and the electoral victory and partly because many of them of the cadre were a political or of the lumpen variety. So, in Naxalbari we see that quite a few took the refugee within the CPC which has been close alliance with the Congress party and this was facilitated by the mass arrest, tortures and indiscriminate liquidation of the cadres. This brutal suppression was once again possible because of the conspirational means used to annihilate the class enemies and the decision by the CPI ML to establish the supremacy of the red terror over the white terror. This misinterpretation of Mayoism by Charu Mazumdar was communicated to him by the CPC sometimes in the early 1971, but fearing about the repercussions that such a critique of the policy uh, from China would have to have on the leaders and cadres of the movement. It was neither released for the discussion nor disclosed to the leaders until just before Mazumdar's arrest in July 1972. Now, let us speak uh, about uh, the region. Uh, I think we had enough grounding about uh, uh, what is the uh, framework in which we are trying to discuss upon the Naxalbari movement, but now let us try to speak about the region in which it has germinated. Uh, Darjeeling is a frontier district of India and it is bound on the north by Sikkim, on the northeast by Bhutan, on the west by Nepal and on the southeast by Bangladesh. So, in 1971 it had the popul total population of uh, <coughs> 781 uh, 777 
uh, with an adverse female sex ratio of 882 and a low density of population of 254 per square kilometer compared to the West Bengal density of 504. Interestingly enough, the literacy rate at 33.07 percent compares marginally better with the average of 33.2 percent for the state as a whole. The percentage of cultivators to the total workers has declined from 37.5 in 1961 to 30.46 30 30 in 1971. But the percentage of agricultural laborers to the total workforce has increased from 2.9 to 9.12 percent within the same decade. So, I think uh, that is quite alarming whether or not this is strongly suggestive of a downward mobile group from cultivators to agriculture labor should forms an important aspect of the economic analysis of the district. And there is also a marginal decline in the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribe population which is again interesting. So, the region was characterized by the peasant revolt are the three police stations uh, uh, to name of the Fansi Wada, Fansi Deva, Naxalbari and Khoribari. So, these were the three police stations where the episode took place covering an area of about 274 square miles with a population of uh, uh, 150,000. There are 32 tea gardens in the area with a labor population comprising the 30 percent of the total population of the area and the terrain is scenic with the forest and plantation. The cultivation is largely of paddy and jute and the area is of strategic importance. One principal feature of this region is the high percentage of sharecroppers and among those owning 5 acres or less the percentage of sharecroppers in Naxalbari, Fasiwada and Khoribari are 60 percent, 65 percent and 50.1 percent respectively. These were the marginal presence in the Tebhaga movement as well as in the recent Naxalbari uprising who provided the main thrust for the movement. In comparison to the sharecroppers, there are few agricultural laborers in the area like 4.6 percent in Naxalbari and 6.1 percent in Fasiwadeva and 5.4 percent in Kharibari. However, one has to understand the structure and the historical background uh, of the institution of the crop sharing associated with this part of Bengal and in order to able to appreciate the peasant mobilization that took place. Now, I think after understanding the region, let us try to see uh, what is the community, uh, what is the composition of the community. So, regarding the community, the Rajbhansis are the most preponderance community in the population of this region and uh, in the Jalpaiguri. They constitute nearly 25 percent of the population of the entire Tarai region and certainly more than 50 percent of the population in the region of the peasant unrest. It is said that this community is a aboriginal tribe earlier known as the Koch around the 15th and the 16th centuries under their leaders. They founded the Koch kingdom on the ruins of the ancient Hindu kingdom of Kamrup with Kuch Bihar as its metropolis. So, with the introduction of the Brahmanism, the two generation later they abandoned the name Koch and adopted the name of Raj Bansi, literally of royal kindred. Obviously, not all the Koch become Raj Bansis, so a hierarchy emerged. Many Koch who were denied entry into the Raj Bansi community opted for Islam. Thus, the struggle for higher status led one section of course to become Rajbhansis and another section to become the Muslims. Those who remained coach therefore had to accept the lower status. So, virtually we try to see uh, the sort of stratification which has been there among the Rajbhansis and all of them were not treated equally. <coughs> Parallelly, the Orans, Mundas and the Santhals constitute the large proportion of the population in this region. Historically, their immigration from Chota Nagpur and neighboring regions seem to have been prompted by the need of the plantation owner to have the labor force which could clear the forest and engage in the efficient plantation labor. The tribals of these regions were found most suitable and were presumably brought into the region as endangered labor. This aspect of migration requires a more thorough study. 
Unfortunately, readily available historical material on the agrarian relations in this frontier forest regions of North Bengal is dismally inadequate. What constitutes the district of Darjeeling and Jalpaiguri was annexed by the <coughs> British from the Bhutan in 1865 after a war, war into which we had been reluctant, uh, reluctantly forced by aggressive and insults. However, of the Jalpaiguri region, the report of uh, the Deputy Commissioner of the West Dwarfs on the land tenures on the part of the country dated September 1865 tells that the Bhutias were foreigners in the Dwarfs and in this respect they are they and <coughs> in respect they and ourselves are equal. The inhabitants of the Dwarfs are Hindus and Mamdans with the exceptions of migratory mates who live along with the base of mountains. So, the hunter's statistical account unfortunately has a lesson the Jyotidari system of the Terai region of Darjeeling district that of the Jalpaiguri districts. But since both these tracts of lands were annexed by the British from the Bhutanese and both seem to have a predominantly non Bhutia population the more characteristics of the Indian communities. So, that way I think uh, the sort of community is quite complex it has the uh, invasions we have uh, people not only from India, but also from uh, outside India and also we try to see that a certain amount of distinctions have been there with regard to the population composition. Now, let us try to uh, speak about the social structure of the area. Uh, regarding the social structure, the agrarian hierarchy in the pre-British period in the Jalpaiguri region was headed by Subha or the Bhutia Lieutenant Governor who has no personal interest in the soil or uh, as landlord or the tenant. His function was to transmit revenue collected from his area to the royal authority after attaining for himself a sanctioned portion. He was appointed the authority with no guarantee of permanency of position. Under him were the several tessilars or kathans who were of respectable birth and of a good repute in the country. Next in the uh, agrarian hierarchy came the Jyotidars, a person who holds in severity the joint or in common a piece of land for which he pays revenue directly to the government uh, through his agent uh, that is the Tehsildars. The original Jyotidars it seems were the settlers who clear forest land make it fit for cultivation and then they then such lands would make uh, becomes their jyots. Thereafter, the rule of succession would apply to the ownership and control over the jyots. This process in fact was encouraged by the Bhutia Rajas and the governors who went uh, who were uh, to allow settlers to occupy unpopulated tract of the country for a term of 5 years more or less without payment of revenue and jyots however, could be acquired by purchase or as gift or grants from the Bhutia Raja. So, the Jyotidar could operate as a peasant proprietor cultivating and disposing his produce in any manner he deemed fit. But the Jyotidars uh, could also choose to play the role of superior landlords in relation to the inferior estate, the tenants that is the tenants, the uh, Chokhnidars or the uh, Mulayandars were those who entered into contract for a period of more than one year with the Jyotidars on the fixed money rentals. The contract was temporarily with no rights of sale or transfer except with the explicit permission of the Jyotidars. The riots in comparison were yearly tenants paying annual money rents to the Jyotidars. The last in the hierarchy was the Praja or the tenant at will who paid his rent in kind. Further, he was without the capital and was dependent on the Jyotidar for his seed, plow, cattle and implement of agriculture. So, the seed advance was reduced at the harvest time and the balance produce shared equally. Interestingly enough, there was no tendency towards the growth of a distinct class of day that is the uh, daily laborers in Jalpaiguri districts, 
neither the renting land nor possessing field of their own. However, there were those cultivating small patches of land who would also till the fields of others on the basis of equal sharing and these were the Adhihar cultivators who <coughs> in the Bhutia region had to be given every kind of inputs by the Jyotidars and the only factor of production they could claim as their own was the manual labor. Undoubtedly, they must have been from the Praja category of tenant at will uh, who unable to meet the basic requirements and would become the adhyar on the crop sharing basis. So, the Terai region extended, extending over to the Himalayan foothills uh, was annexed in 1850 and the northern portion was attached to the Darjeeling districts and in this region the revenue collection collector before the British were the Bengali officers known as the Chaudhrys who were not only the chief landlord holders and Jyotidars in the area, but also exercised the civil and the criminal power. When the British administrators took over the uh, took over, they were retained with some alteration in the profit, but were stripped of their civil and criminal power. However, by 1864, the institution of Chaudhrys was abolished and the government entered into the direct settlement with the Jyotidars. The Jyotidars in this region were on leasehold land, usually renewable on termination of the lease period. Initially, they were given, they were given 3 years contract, which by 1853 was increased to 10 years period. Apart from Chaudhry, we find another variation in this region when compared to the agrarian structure of Jalpaiguri. In addition to the Praja, there was also uh, Thikadars instead of paying uh, produce rent as the prajas, the thikadars paid money, rent and kept the entire produce. Also, uh, we try to see that like in the Jalpaiguri region, no class of daily laborers could be discerned, children of 10 years of age and upward are commonly employed on agricultural labor only during the leaf picking season in the tea plantation. Thus, the first indication of the advent of wage labor in the form of child labor can be noticed in the plantation sector. This Jyotidari system of the 19th century uh, crystallized into the prominent system called as the Jyotidari Adhihari system uh, by the 20th century. We have already noted that the landlord tenant configuration in which the structural position of the tenant at will that is Praja was precarious. It has also been observed that this group of Prajas did not own any of the means of production and had to engage in Adhihari cultivation. Over a period of time, the Adhihari system became a necessary and inevitable com complement of the Jyotidari system because the Jyotidars in general were not peasant proprietors who also tilled their own land. Hence, the gulf between the owner and the tiller widened to the advantage of the owners, the Praja become the Adhyars. So, virtually we try to see that Praja uh, who were the Adhyars and you have the Rajas <coughs> which were basically the Jyotidars. So, that relationship has been generated through time. By about the fourth decade of the century, the agrarian system of exploitation had sufficiently crystallized all over the Bengal. and we try to find out this crystallization of Jyotidari Adhihari system was also expressed in the physical terms. The residential pattern of each Jyot was mainly the Jyotidar Praja complex. Around the Jyotidar establishment, we could uh, would be located the house of Adhiyars or the Prajas. These, uh, this residential configuration constituted a Jyot named after the original Jyotidar and the Adhiyar seldom has a residence uh, which he could claim as his own. He was the Jyotidar who provided the shelter and cattle plough, but here the broad generalities also ended. There were variation within the category of uh, Adhyars. The most preferred Adhyars who gained precedence and uh, uh, <coughs> favor over the others were those who did not claim any share of the crop they produced. After harvesting, the entire paddy was taken to the landlord's threshing floor, which is called as Khamar and nothing was taken by the Praja. The condition of work followed the dictum, 
I will feed you, you produce for me. However, although the most preferred by the landlord, this was not the most pervasive form of adhiyayan uh, for the ratio provided by Jyotidar. Besides, this limited uh, support, the freedom of consumption, whatever may be the meaning of such freedom in the real terms, the more prevalent form of adhyari was based on the system of sharecropping. On completion of harvesting, the adhyar received his share of produce after certain standard conventional deduction. The usual procedure followed was that the grain would first be stocked on the landlord's threshing floor and the entire crop would then be divided into two halves. The adhyar share would then undergo the following deduction. First is that if the cattle plough has been provided by the landlord, a deduction of 8 mons would be affected. <coughs> Second is, if the seeds were supplied by the landlord, twice the amount would be retrieved. The third was, for every mound of crop uh, weighted by the <coughs> morale, we try to find out that uh, a deduction of 10 seeds would be made. Uh, fourthly, if the adhyar had borrowed paddy from the landlord as a consumption loan, one and half times the amount of paddy would be deducted. And fifth is, if the jyotidar needed to conduct to construct a granary, he would deduce 10 to 20 shares of paddy. And finally, anywhere between 2.5 shares to 5 shares uh, would be deducted for the maintenance of the jyotidar's stable. So, I think uh, uh, we try to see that uh, the amount of uh, production whatsoever has been made by adhyar was further put for deduction uh, after dividing it into two halves. As a consequence of such extraction, the little that the adhyar could take back home was grossly insu insufficient for his minimum needs. Will the <coughs> with that result, uh, he would end up borrowing from the landlord. Thus, this continued the story of ever increasing burden of debt which kept the adhyars bonded uh, through time. While we have examined that this jyotidar adhyar relationship in its structural aspect, it is also necessary to examine it <coughs> in a dynamic procedure too. Jyotidar would often want to clear forest and make them fit for cultivation so that they could augment their income. Often the parcel of forest land would be given to person free of rent, an arrangement uh, which is made, uh, which is called as uh, <coughs> the muafi uh, khawa that is eating the tree. In about 3 to 4 years of hard and exacting labor, the land would become fit for cultivation. No sooner would it be start yielding a crop than the uh, patedar would imp impose a thika or a contract based on the assessment of the expected yield. And that is how we try to see that the relations are going to be uh, seen structurally corrected by the jyotidars on the basis of the amount of land that has been cleared. So, we try to see that the relationship of dependency and exploitations were not confined to the relations of production. The institution of begar or the free labor was also prevalent in other parts of the country. Uh, took the various forms. Uh, first is the adhyar was expected to supply free labor for the jyotidar kitchen garden. Uh, this included the cultivation of vegetables as well as other works like erecting the fence around the strong kettles. Second is periodic repairs to the jyotidar's house was the responsibility of adhyars. And thirdly, if any marriage was finalized in the adhyar's family, the jyotidar has to give a uh, bhet that is some kind of presentation in his honor, uh, honor. and this could be uh, a goat or a small, uh, some rice, dal, vegetable etcetera. And the bhet was uh, an article of food uh, sufficient in quantity for the jyotidar's entire household. So, we try to see that uh, in all means the adhyars were being exploited by the jyotidar's. The jyotidar also appropriated to himself the role of judiciary at the jyot's level. He would not permit dispute to taken to the formal institution of justice and pronounce his own judgment whenever necessary. So, punishment of offenses would range from the fines payable in cash to jyotidars 
to beating and expulsion from the Jyot. During the popular festival, the Jyotidas would encourage the Adhihars to accept the food and meat articles to uh, make merry. Later on, uh, however, uh, they would retrieve twice the amount supplied to them uh, that is going to be an important issue. Thus, the Jyotidari Adhari system has perfect, uh, perfected the exploitation of the labor of the Adhyar by every conceivable means keeping him utterly dependent on the Jyotidar. With no alternative occupation choice upon open to him, the Adhyars became reliant on the Jyotidars for his very survival. This was the structure of relationship between the Jyotidars and the Adhyars. Uh, this does not uh, did not preclude, however, the existence of enlightened Jyotidars who operating within the exploitative system. That is, they should not would exploit their labor within the framework of the system without becoming oppressive. So, I think uh, this is where we try to see the exploitative system which has to be seen in terms of Jyotidari Adhyari relationship. And now, let us try to come specific to the Naxalwari peasant struggle. The Naxalwari peasant struggle was launched in 1967 March and this movement has uh, taken Tebhaga uh, which occurred in 1946 uh, present movement as its torch bearer. So, I think uh, Tebhaga was a torch bearer for the Naxalbari movement. The last wave of Tebhaga movement died on the shores of North Bengal in a place called Patharghata in Siliguri. Tebhaga movement was dead in body, but the light provided by Tebhaga inspired the Naxalbari movement. The prime objective of this movement was to change the whole society, not the condition of present alone. Then the Naxalbari movement was highly charged by ideology of violence. The idiom of movement was that power comes from the barrel of the gun and not by the slogan and non-violence. The idiom of the movement was that power comes from the barrel becomes important. And we try to see that the movement was aimed at the total annihilation of the big farmers, landlords and jagirdars. Nothing short of it could change the structure of the society. Naxalbari is a police station in the dazzling district of West Bengal. It is in the name of the police substation that the movement is known all over. At a later stage, it took an ideological flavor. So, virtually the term Naxalbari which has been part of the Naxalbari movement is based on the police substation uh, which name was Naxalbari and on the, that particular instance where the uh, police station was burned. So, that particular thing was taken into consideration and Naxalbari uh, has got its nomenclature from that particular police station uh, which was been burned. From 1950 to 1967, the demand of present have not lost their continuity. After the West Bengal State Acquisition Act was passed in 1953, the legislation brought an era of Benami land holding. The split in CPI in 1964 resulted in most of the leaders of Darjeeling District Committee opting for the radical CPIM. The leader organized Milita of 1 to 2000 Santhals armed with bows and arrows. At this stage, the evolution of the Naxalwari was seen with its principal architect Kanu Sanyal. From 1953 to 57 was a period of the present worker alliance as the united class of workers. The subdivision, the subdivisional Kisan Samiti in Naxalbari gave the call against the Jyotidars and Sanyal has listed the following items in the call. First is reap and store the harvest at your own place and raise the red flag. Second is Jyotidar to furnish the proof of their ownership before the present communities. The third is arm yourself to protect the crop. And the fourth is save your crop from police. And finally, we have liquidation of the class enemies by a program of annihilation through the use of the guerrilla tactics. So, one principal feature of this region of Darjeeling is the high percentage of sharecropper. It is because of this that the Naxalbari movement was essentially a movement launched by the sharecropper. In the beginning of the movement, uh, it was remained restricted to the three police station 
namely the Fasiwada, Fasideva, Naxalbari and Khorabari having a population of about 1 lakh. The percentage of share coppers in and around these three police stations came to be 65 to and 50 respectively. The commonly grown crop by the people includes the paddy and the jute. The Rajbansis by the most preponderance community of the region and they constitute more than 50 percent of the region. It is said that the entire community was a tribal group known as the Koch. We also see that the growing influence of Brahmanism in the region also has led to certain amount of transformation uh, which has been highlighted and uh, we try to see that the Jyotidars who were basically seen as the present proprietors uh, has to lease out the lands to the tenants in the form of uh, uh, the rayats and ultimately it was the uh, Adhyars who has to cultivate the land on the basis of equal sharing and this is how we try to see the sort of arrangement was been made. So, the production relation of the Darjeeling districts uh, has consisted of the nexus of Jyotidar, Rayat, Praja, Adhyar. So, that is how we try to see the linkage under this system. The cultivator was merely reduced to the status of sharecropper. The sharecropper was completely in a state of dependency and suffered the exploitation and succumbed to the bondages. While writing about uh, write, writing anything on the Naxal Bari present movement, it must be observed categorically that the movement was started by sharecroppers. Second, it was ins inspired by the Tebhaga movement and the region now being in Bangladesh. Following are some of the important causes of the movement. The first is the landlords uh, who were supposed to be the real owners used to take a large share out of the produce made by the sharecroppers. The general share taken by the landlord varied from one half to one third. It was quite excessive. The sharecroppers which included the rayats, praja and adhyars demanded the reduction of the share of produce. Another cause of the movement was the demand for regulation and distribution of the Benami land in an appropriate way way by the peasants. Thirdly, the share corporate had no power with them. They were helpless under the bondage of the big land holders and it was major cause for the uprising. Fourthly, the Naxalbari movement was admittedly a movement of the present but above all the major cause of the movement was the class war between the big farmers and the ordinary peasants. Uh, fifth, the share copper alleged that they were against the dependency of the big farmers. The big farmers were guided by the motto, I will feed you, you produce for me. And also we try to see the Praja has to submit to the Begar that is to work as Hali or the Veti system uh, that is again a system of exploitation. And also we try to see the last uh, uh, cause that is the judiciary of the district was uh, in all cases in favor of the big farmers. The Praja was always victimized by the judiciary. So, I think uh, these are the sharp conditions uh, which has basically led uh, to make the Naxalbari movement to come to its peak. The production relationship between the Jyotidar that is the formal Rajbansis with the Praja that is the Adhyar and that is how the share coppers were strained. The exploited masses of peasants were groaning to engineer a revolutionary struggle and the course of the event that led to the Naxalbari movement can be showed in this way. The first thing is that Charu Majumdar who was the architect of uh, uh, this important movement was the leader of the Naxalbari movement. There was a group of revolutionary leaders known as the Siligru groups. This group gave out six documents known as the guidelines for the peasants. The, do the documents advocated the ideology which worked behind the Naxalbari movement. The sum and the substance of the six documents includes the militancy was the guiding ideology for capturing the power. Charu Majumdar and his group preached the violence to the peasant saying that land was to be given to the tillers and the congress was to be defeated and the mobilization of the peasantry was made on the lines of class consciousness. It was planned to establish a people's government after annihilating the Jyotidar and Zamindars through the armed revolution. The participants 
uh, to the struggle were the peasants who were sharecroppers and who identified big farmers Jyotidar as their class enemies. Thus, the movement was mobilized against the landed propertied class and for this movement it can safely be said that the broad based peasantry inclusive of all the strata was involved in the struggle. Second thing is that during the month of March 1967, the violent leaders of the movement killed a moneylenders within the jurisdiction of Naxalbari police station and this murder was followed by a series of other murders and one of after another the Jyotidars Sahukars were killed by the participants of the movement. The third is that the message of the movement were given through several slogans. Some of the slogans were borrowed from the Bhaga peasant movement and throughout the area the leadership to the movement was given to Panchanan Sarkar, Kanu Sanyal and others. And fourthly we try to see that in course of time the movement got ablaze in a different parts of West Bengal, the college students including the female participants in the movement and the movement thus was not only a movement of the peasant but the society at a large. So these are the uh, situations which has made the Naxalbari to be more effective. The Naxalbari movement was essentially against the big farmers that is the Jyotidars and we try to see that though there was no immediate gain of the struggle, it definitely influenced the course of peasant movement in the country. The Naxalbari movement was a specific struggle ideologically oriented to the Marxian socialism. Uh, in the Jyotidar Adhyar relations, there was a visible contradictions in capital and labor. The deprivation of Adhyars and for that matter for the Rayats and the Praja was due to the process of differentiation resulting from the force of history and modernization. The rank and the file of communist party has made the Adhyars conscious of the contradictions which turn them into the paper or poverty. Yet another outcome of the Naxalbari movement was that like other movement of the country it did not stand for or put the demand for structural change in the old feudal system. Instead the movement ideologically and operationally too stood for the systematic change which could end exploitation and operational inherent in the semi federal system. So, uh, what is the concern of the Naxalbari movement? I think uh, that will be quite interesting. So, it is interesting to note that Rajbhansi Jyotidars never developed a conscious of consciousness of class. The one time prosperous Rajbhansi Jyotidars bemoan the fact that they could never unite in the strength to counter the challenge of Krishak Samiti threats. Leading Bengali lawyers uh, with outstanding professional credentials as owners of Jyots sought to give a leadership to the Rajvansi Jyotidars, but they have failed. It is significant that most of the targets were the Rajvansi Jyotidars as the non <coughs> Rajvansi Bengali Jyotidars were the non residents. So, in few cases the tribals were targeted, but almost invariably uh, there were Christians, even the class organization of the Rajvansi Jyotidar weakened and the peasant classes grew uh, more and more strength uh, through time. So, it is interesting to note that Rajvansi Jyotidars developed, never developed a consciousness of class by coming together. The one time prosperous Rajvansi's Jyotidar bemoan to the fact that uh, they are not going to challenge the uh, typical Krishak Samiti threats. So, mobilization used to take place. Uh, the agrarian social system was less evolved and simply stratified. Thus, between the Jyotidar and Adhyars, there was no intervening categories. So, the categories was discrete, the exploitation and discrimination was direct and such a system was vulnerable to the class polarization. So, the definition of the exploiter and the exploited was visible and clear and did not require any sophisticated analysis of the uh, or distinction. So, the alliance of classes on this account was not difficult to form. It is obvious that the middle and the poor peasantry peasants had nothing to lose as they did not get their lands cultivated by adhyars. So, their support could be sought against the landlords. One can now safely hypothesize in the present circumstances in which the classes do not stand in sharp and direct relationship between themselves, 
when a single community communist party contending against a single congress party has changed to a situation uh, in which half a dozen marxist and non marxist parties are competing amongst each other so we try to see that any class contradictions can be sharp enough to bring about the class mobilization for the structural change as in the past and finally uh, if we look at the movement dynamics it is initial phase of the movement that the present associations sought to bring about a series of quasi structural changes it sought to obtain for the adhars better and less exploitative uh, in terms of uh, in terms with the jyotidar its claim for tebhaga and its struggle against all other forms of redu reduction for the legitimate crops share are illustrated in terms of the means adopted for combination of the legal and the non institutional means so in 1969 the movement stepped up uh, in the non institutional means and stopped using any in institutionalized means and took up pledge uh, plung <coughs> for the revolutionary transformation by inactivating the quasi movement structure this resulted in invoking the much larger might of the state on the one hand and the loss of legitimacy for the movement from the quasi movement base so the loss of the movement had since been uh, seen uh, becoming complex in the naxal bari and we try to see that uh, this has resulted into the complexity of the movement so we can say that uh, in this discussion we can uh, came to know that how the existing social structure played a crucial role in the emergence of the movement we also try to see that how the prevalence of jyotidari adhyari relations that has to uh, extend sharpened the issue between the peasantry and the landed masses and also we try to see the existence of cpi in different forms and having the different strategies uh, to support the issue and culmination of the political social environment so it has led to the emergence and propagation of the movement in the north east india and in the parts of west bengal so i think uh, uh, these movements uh, uh, which we have tried to see and out of them naxalbari happens to be the most uh, uh, salient uh, movement and the reason being that uh, this movement as we have shared earlier also that its concern was not to bring about the tnc reforms and also to bring about the change in the agrarian structure rather it wanted to have certain amount of permanency with regard to the revolutionary transformation and that way if you try to see the sort of structural changes that they were demanding uh, sometimes they were fighting against the state they were fighting against the administration and that way they wanted to bring about the change so i think uh, enough grounding which has been provided by the previously tebhaga movement which was seen as the torch bearer of the naxalbari movement uh, had given a good grounding uh, for the naxalbari movement and that way if you try to see i think a certain amount of training and extension which has been done by the cpi during the tebhaga movement has been carried forward in the different ways uh, when we try to see that uh, <coughs> the so called uh, naxalbari has come into prominence and we try to see that the various uh, uh, phases of cpi rather the different shades of cpi in the form of cpi cpi ml or cpi uh, marxist all the different flavors of uh, the communist party came into prominence and they try to give a different color to the naxalbari movement so i think uh, if you try to see that way i think it was uh, politically mobilized and their one point agenda was uh, to have a defeat to the center in terms of uh, the congress government and the cpi wanted to have the upper hand uh, both in terms of uh, the power holding and also in terms of bringing about the transformation at the grassroots level and that way we try to see the cadre of cpi uh, basically with regard to the naxalbari movement was very high and uh, i think uh, uh, the credit goes to uh, the chief architect of uh, the naxalbari movement that is kanu sanyal and the others especially charu mazumdar uh, who try to give a very different color to the naxalbari movement uh, from the very starting and uh, as we have shared that uh, since 1967 onwards we try to see that uh, the 
sort of a peasant movement in the form of Naxalbari had started coming into the limelight and we try to see that uh, this sort of movement which was basically trying to bring about uh, the change in the structure in terms of uh, ending up of the uh, Jyotidari system so that the Adhiharis have the better composition in terms of their representation. But more important is that uh, they try to identify uh, with themselves a specific st strategy which we try to see basically the use of the guerrilla tactics uh, which has been used and we try to see that how uh, <coughs> the Naxalbari uh, has basically taken into consideration uh, a sort of revolutionary steps in terms of uh, uh, reaping the uh, crop and putting it at their own place and also raising the red flags. Similarly, we try to see that the involvement of the tribal <coughs> into the Naxalbari also had uh, geared up the whole momentum and we try to see that uh, through time the uh, so called uh, representation of uh, the population tribal population into the Naxalbari movement has grown up and that basically speaks about that how uh, the so called uh, tribes when they entered into the agrarian relations uh, they try to have certain revolutionary characters which are represented through the Naxalbari movement. And in that way, uh, we try to see that uh, uh, the various uh, attempts which has been made at different places or even the nomenclature which has been taken uh, uh, through the police station also is seen as uh, more radical and revolutionary and also it has certain amount of violence. So, the <coughs> message which basically goes is that uh, we try to see that Naxalbari is something uh, which has uh, led to the further extension in terms of formation of uh, the movement at the different places and uh, it had its uh, uh, Jharkhand uh, which are considered to be the epicenter of uh, the Naxalite activities are now gearing up to the Andhra Pradesh and that way if you try to see uh, we try to find out that uh, Naxalbari has uh, its prominence and uh, we sometimes try to say that uh, the fight is uh, uh, gr gradually turning into the new aspects and basically uh, their grievances which has been historically uh, could not be addressed and now with the momentum of this movement uh, they are trying to show their resentment and in that way they are trying to work against the functioning of the government. And that way if you try to see uh, earlier we try to see that uh, the issue was basically against the center in terms of Congress party but now we try to see that uh, uh, the Nexalite activities are basically anti to the state uh, many times and that way I think uh, uh, disturbing the, the, the structure of the government or any other such measures is basically uh, giving a message that they wanted that the sort of injustice that has happened in the past and they wanted to continue that resentment and uh, even I think uh, uh, the time has come that we have to really see that to what extent this uh, Nexalite uh, ideology has to be carried forward. I think through time uh, what has been realized that uh, the CPI uh, which was considered to be an important tool for mobilizing the so called uh, Naxalbari uh, initiatives now is gradually been uh, replacing and now we try to see certain other uh, parallel revolutionary groups may be entering uh, into the picture and uh, the important thing is that we have to see that how uh, these sort of activities are to be uh, culminated. Uh, ultimately, we try to see that uh, the next light uh, activities which are been taken, uh, they are basically seen as anti-national and that way I think uh, involving certain amount of terrorism uh, with regard to the uh, state policies. But I think uh, what we have to see that to what extent we can uh, be in a position to uh, fulfill the grievances which they had and uh, the state's role has to be proactive in terms of uh, bringing about certain amount of rehabilitation uh, which was missing in the past and that way I think uh, there can be seen as certain solution to this whole issue. So, I think uh, friends uh, uh, since Naxalbari movement is uh, uh, has, be, has a history but it is continuing. So, we can always say that there are hopes that uh, this present movement has its legacy even in the global era and that way we have to see that how it is going to be an important issue in terms of discussion. So, I think uh, these are certain things uh, that we have to make, uh, we try to cover up various present movements and 
it will be followed by the farmers movement which we will try to see in a new form in the coming lecture and that way I think uh, our readings for the present movements are going to be substantive. I think for further readings you can have the contribution by D. N. Dhanagre on present movement in India and we have air the size contribution on agrarian struggle in India after independence and also one can read the social movement in India by M. S. Rao of 1979. So, I think uh, from these uh, for the readings we can have more better understanding about uh, the Naxalbari movement. So, thank you for the patient listening and I hope we can interact again for further deliberations on the understanding of the rural society. Thank you to all of you.